thank you so much for coming and attending our session tonight. I'm going to go ahead and give you a brief overview about Women Plus Plus and about the current program we have on offer before I go ahead and introduce Joanna to you, our guest, our presenter for this evening. So Women Plus Plus is a Swiss nonprofit organization, as you can see, dedicated to increasing diversity in the tech industry. So we have a participation of about 80% of our programs as women. Why is that really, why does that matter to us? Because the tech sector needs more women. There is a leaky pipeline that we really want to respond to. And so what we do with our programs is to create opportunities for women to enter the tech sector, give them opportunities to take up more space and to pursue leadership. And we're really proud to say that as a result of our programs, we have seen more and more women being able to do precisely that. And as you can see below, our core values are leadership, education, inclusion, and collaboration. So while we do emphasize women taking up space, it's very important for us to create a space where all genders feel welcome and feel like they have a space to contribute and do meaningful work together. Currently, the program that we have on offer is called Deploy Impact. And as you can see, it is going to be starting very soon on October 16th, and it will run for six weeks remotely until November 27th. This is a women-friendly, friendly to all genders, hands-on software development program for social good. What does that mean? Let's get a little bit into that. So in this program, we have three groups of what we like to call protagonists. The first is NGOs. Now, more than ever, NGOs are striving to do incredibly meaningful work, but they need tech support. More and more, the work that they strive to do cannot be done without effective technological solutions. And that's where our participants come in. So we have been in the process of searching for the best and brightest and eagerest minds uh, of participants coming from a wide variety of tech and domain expertise to lend those skills, to lend that expertise towards these tech projects with the NGO serving as product owners. And our third group of protagonists are our mentors. We have a beautiful group of mentors that's forming currently coming from world-renowned tech companies. And we're really eager to bring this group of experts together with these young, bright, eager minds to serve these very meaningful projects that I'll be explaining in a little moment. Uh, the first is InZone, which is a project powered by the University of Geneva. Uh, and they are offering world-class hybrid education for refugees in refugee camps in Kenya and Jordan. And we have a project prepared that participants can contribute to, to make that work more sustainable um, and more efficient. And the second NGO we'll be working with is called Kona Connect. And Kona Connect is focusing specifically on developing uh, tech solutions to help refugees and marginalized individuals worldwide access legal aid, which is incredibly important. So what is this program going to look like? It's going to be a very collaborative interdisciplinary experience with teams formed from participants who have a vast array of different skills that they bring to the table. They'll be working together over six weeks with a time investment of about 10 hours a week and as I mentioned before, this is going to be remote and uh, led and facilitated through an online platform. Here are a few of the benefits of participating in our program. So this is a real opportunity to make a difference for people around the world using your skills to develop software solutions with global reach and demonstrable social impact. And it's also an opportunity to have a direct impact in your own professional development with hands-on experience contributing to a product's development from end to end. This is an opportunity to network, to meet bright minds like yours, as well as to meet mentors who are a few steps ahead of where you are today and can help you to access the work opportunities and the new, oppor the new opportunities to grow your skills that just might lead you to your dream job. And just to sweeten the pot a little bit more, the most successful solution per project 
will win a prize. So I just want to introduce Joanna, who's going to be facilitating our workshop tonight. Joanna is a software engineer who's been working in the development team of Nothing Are Gay for four years. She has already played a key role in various large customer projects uh, as a front-end developer, where she has led technical implementation of web applications as well as websites. She uses her analytical skills on a daily basis to lay out the possible solutions and build solid foundations for long-term development, whether that's in the coding or in the collaboration. And in her free time, she doesn't hesitate to showcase to women of all ages that coding is something that's fun and it's exciting and it's worth getting involved in. So on that note, Joanna, I want to thank you for joining us today, and we're really happy to pass the mic to you so you can get started. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for the, for the intro. I would propose you that we get started with the presentation of today. So welcome, everybody, to my talk about accessibility on the web, history, strangers' usage, and good practices in code. I hope you can hear me and see me well, and if not, please just make a sign. First and foremost, my special thanks goes to the team of Women++ who put great efforts in supporting women in tech, for which I'm really grateful for. This presentation, as said earlier, is part of the Deploy Impact Workshop that will start in a few weeks, where I will be helping out as mentor from Nothing AG, the company for which I am working, as we are one of the sponsors of this event. So before starting this presentation, a small note on its logistics. You should all have received the link of this set of slides that is broadcasted per email if you registered. If that's not the case, you can simply go on the event description and get it from there. We advise you to use this only as additional aid and for future reference. And instead, keep your eyes on the shared screen, which remains the main reference. Indeed, I'm going to switch between applications or play videos from time to time, so it's better to follow up me there. Nevertheless, this link will remain available after the presentation. So in case you wish to check back some things, like going on the various links that you can recognize with the anchor link symbol or open up the shown code snippets, you will be able to do this. As the presentations will contain several parts, let's quickly review what will be the outline together. First, I will be doing a small intro. Then we will dig into why is accessibility so important by reviewing core historical points up to nowadays. Afterwards, we will step into a more practical part where we will check code snippets to make complex and accessible JavaScript widgets with simple HTML. In order to take the best out of the most more complete complex autocomplete example we will see at the very end, we will make a quick step to have an introduction to screen readers via a gamified approach. So just in case you never heard about this word, uh, so screen reader before, simply stated, screen readers are systems that read websites through audio, a bit like audiobooks. With this knowledge, after a small five minute break, we will be able to review the accessibility level of well-known autocomplete examples made by big companies, as well as a more custom one. Finally, we will reach the outro during which questions will be answered. So to start with, let me quickly reintroduce myself, although Women++ team already mentioned the most important things earlier. So my name is Joanna Salate. I initially graduated from EPFL as software engineer, and four years ago, I landed in the very exciting domain of web development. And in most of my days, I'm working on front-end code. As a woman, being a minority in my sector, I naturally became very interested about the topic of diversity in general and gender in particular. And I'm very grateful for organizations like Women++, which pushes the topic forward. Today, we are going to talk about a similar topic, which is the inclusion of all individuals. Indeed, as someone working in technology, I deeply believe it's an opportunity and a responsibility to make a positive impact on this world, and this can be done by taking care of accessibility. As quickly mentioned previously, I'm currently working at Nothing AG, which is a peer-to-peer -peer organized digital agency and venture lab located close to Bern in Switzerland. In our daily work, we aim to transform revolutionary ideas into pioneering products. 
Each of our creations is a small contribution to designing a future where technology is used as a tool for humanity and not as a weapon. Our current leading project is Peerdom, a tool to help organizations map their organization model to empower their employees and reduce bureaucracy. Here you can see a demo organization maps within Peerdom. If that sparked your interest, don't hesitate to reach out to us so that we can support you. We are a team of about 20 people, and we love to discover and motivate new talents to join us. Actually, we are doing that right now for positions as developer, developers and designers. Next to our mission to transform grand ideas into pioneering projects, we also strive to use our competencies to have a meaningful impact on the digital world and beyond. Typically, one of our goals, which we try to promote via events like this, is to become a well-known accessibility-first company in and outside Switzerland. Kind of a go-to organization when it comes down to actively create accessible solutions. For this purpose, we use our skills and competencies to help you on your accessibility journey. We offer design reviews, semantic HTML prototyping, visual and functional prototyping, reviews and optimizations of your existing projects, and presentations and workshops, like the one I'm holding today. But we can also create custom private ones for your needs. All in all, we are happy to work hands-on your project. We can provide you with written and video documentation for your future usage. We have our own accessibility expert in the house, uh, Joshua Muhaim, that you will see today as he prepared for us some videos. But in case you need to reach out directly to him, you can contact him on his email address or go on our accessibility page. That's all for this small intro about presenting ourselves. So let's start with a bit of history to understand why is accessibility so important. So the times up to 20 years ago, basically before 2000, were kind of the dark ages of accessibility. If we start in 1880, the first typewriter was invented by an Italian called Pellegrino Turi. He also invented the ink paper at that time to be used in typewriters. So we contributed quite a lot to this technology. The interesting thing for us is that he invented this typewriter for his blind friend, the Countess Carolina Fantoni da Fivigiano. Indeed, Carolina told Pellegrino that she wanted to communicate with her friends through letters, but she didn't have the possibility for that yet. That's why Pellegrino helped her with this by providing her with a typewriter, where she could write letters to be read by non-blind people, but she could still not read the letters she received back, as it was normal visual writing she couldn't decode. So typically, she couldn't proofread what she was writing, as the output was not readable back by her. In this case, what's really interesting is that Pellegrino had to think outside the box to help someone new with disability that had special needs, and he invented something that moves forward the technology for everyone. 20 years later, roughly, Braille, a complex tactile writing system was invented. So this is a system where you use your fingertip to read little bumps in the paper. That's basically a non-visual alphabet. This was invented at the age of 15 by a French named Louis Braille, who was blind after an accident. The thing was that here, we got the opposite problem from before with the typewriter. This time, blind people could read things written in Braille, but there was no easy way to produce Braille, Braille letters. And it's until much later, in the late 19th century, that this writing task was automatized with the creation of the first Braille typewriter. So all in all, the problem with Braille is that it was not usually readable by non-blind people. So the communication between blind and non-blind people was still tedious. Now that we have a bit a better visibility on how blind written communication evolved, let's do a fast forward closer to our modern times, as most probably everything's better now. Or is it really? So until 2010, we already got early digital accessibility as we had stable working screen readers and stable operating system on desktop computer. Here you can see an image of a digital tool called a refreshable Braille system that you can plug into your computer to translate written text of your computer into Braille letters on this device. So already back then, one blind person could already 
scan papers and use OCR, optical character recognition technology, to read those papers, go on the web and navigate on it using screen readers, and finally, read and write without problems with non-blind people, as emails is a common way of communication for everyone, blind or non-blind. The positive side at that time was that the services on the web were simple and traditional. More specifically, there were not so many of them, so the screen readers were handling those web 1.0 pages very well, and it was accessible out of the box. On the contrary, the negative side was that the software and hardware were very expensive, as they were very sophisticated. Typically, this refreshable Braille system was worth thousands of dollars, and screen readers' licenses were also not cheap at all. And what about today now? We can say that we live in a world of opportunities, and I would like to let you first reflect for a second how important is to you the internet and also your smartphone. So I guess you can simply think how many times you already use your smartphone today and for what brand range of activities it was useful to notice that the digital world has a great importance in our world. Otherly said, I think we all agree that nowadays in our modern societies, the internet and our smartphones are an essential part of our daily activities. And actually, this is even more true with the fact that with those devices and technology, we can actually control both the virtual and the physical world, as I guess you might have already heard or even maybe use. Objects functioning with the Internet of Things capability. So this could be, for example, the case if you would operate your coffee machine via your smartphone, as you will see someone do this later on. Now, maybe a surprising information for you, but did you know that with your smartphones, you are carrying with you mobile screen readers? The good thing with them is that they are free and easy to use, as they are built in the main smartphone operating system, as we will see a bit later in this presentation. So there are endless possibilities. Nearly everything that a non-disabled person can do using the smartphone and the internet should be possible for people with many different disabilities. So theoretically speaking, there is no digital barrier. But in fact, there are obstacles on those endless possibilities because compared to 10 years ago, where web pages were simple and traditional, today it looks very different. Modern apps and websites are often very fancy in the sense that they are very visually oriented and they often hold complex interactions. The main problem is that in this process of creating fancy things, a lot of basic requirements are prone to be forgotten. For example, constructing a valid, in the semantical sense, HTML code, allowing the possibility to use the website with the keyboard only, adding text alternatives to images to explain in text what we want to transmit as visual information, or having good color contrast for readability. That's why today we are in fact in the most harmful situation, because disabled people are often excluded from the digital world due to those basic requirements that are not met, making their assistive help useless. Although they are the ones that are by far the most dependent, but also profiting from those digital services. Even more nowadays, as more and more services are transferred from the physical to the virtual world. For example, there is often no human operated desks anymore to take train tickets, and you need to rely on technology only. So we are basically categorically excluding more and more people in this process. This exclusion problem is just becoming bigger and bigger, and if we don't make sure that those services are accessible to all the people, it will just get worse. This means that without reacting, we are heading into a two-class society in the digital world. The two classes being the default users on one side and the people with disability on the other side. Currently, fanciness often goes against usability and accessibility. But technically speaking, they are not against each other. Everything would be ready to make them cohabit. 
So what's important to understand is that the most complex, complex aesthetics can be made absolutely accessible if you take accessibility into account within your process by knowing how to do it, and if you provide a rock-solid basis to add the graphical fanciness on top of it. But now let's talk about the positive sides, the possibilities for today and tomorrow. Indeed, so much is possible if things are done right from the ground, as we will now see with the case of Daniele Corciulo, who is an accessibility expert with only 1.5% A sites, which is really, really low. He can see some colors and some shapes, but he needs to go super close to what he wants to see. He's a former employee of the Foundation Access for All, and he's now working at the Fachtele Studium und Behinderung at University of Zurich. So first, just a small fun fact before moving on. Uh, there is a game called Last of Us 2, which was released last year and offers a blind mode, which is quite astonishing as it's a very complex three-dimensional third-person game. So in this case, Daniela can play this game and he even did a Let's Play video in the SRF digital format. So if you are interested, you can go check it out. But for today, I'd rather show you one song that Daniela wrote called Take Man, My Hand. And in this video clip, you will see how Daniela handles his daily business using digital accessible devices and technology. Pay attention, as you will see different ways that Daniela is enabled by technology. We will summarize these right after the video. Abfahrt, 10 Uhr 3, auf Gleis 13 mit Zug. So as you might have seen, Daniele is enabled to take the public transport by using the timetable online and also in the analog world by using dry handles and following the guidelines for white stick, read paper by scanning and converting them with OCR to text and using text to speech afterwards, identify objects by scanning the barcodes, and finally operate the coffee machine which native tactile software is not accessible at all. There is no physical button, no sound feedback, and so on. And so in this case, he's using Bluetooth connection and the related app, which is more or less accessible on his phone to connect to it. Now, before concluding this first part, and as we will primarily focus on visual disabilities up to blindness, later on we're talking about screen readers, I would like to take the occasion to raise the point that there are a lot of other forms of disability, such as hearing up to deafness, motor impairment, for example, not having arms or not being able to move them. In this case, one wouldn't be able to use a mouse or a touch device. Cognitive and neurological impairments. And very important to keep in mind, there are age-related impairments. And when you think about it, we will all be disabled at some points when we will become older. So to conclude this part, I want to emphasize how caring about accessibility can unlock human potential and empower people. When we strive to create accessible products, it means we strive to reach equality for everyone, regardless of any differences such as physical disabilities. 
This endeavor should not be seen as a mean to create a social welfare state, but should rather be seen as a way to include and unlock all the human potential. We, as a society, can profit from it. As an example, we can think of Stephen Hawking, a very well-known physicist and mathematician. Because when you think about it, disabled people need to think outside the box on a daily basis to navigate their life. That's a trained skill for them that can be very, very valuable for the whole society. So by caring about helping them, we can also use our own out-of-the-box thinking. Remember the typewriter? Maybe if Pellegrino didn't care about helping his blind friend Carolina, we wouldn't have smartphones the way we do nowadays. And for this part, I would like to end on this quote from Carly Fiorina, who is also active in technology, as she was from a time the CEO of the technology company HP, and who stated, human potential is the only limitless resource we have on this earth. And as a society, we do good of trying to unlock it together. Now, let's move on to a more code-based part by talking about complex and accessible JavaScript widgets with simple HTML. So in this picture, you can imagine that the climber is pretty confident, even if he's falling. Indeed, he knows that the rope will do what it's supposed to do and keep him attached to the mountain while he's falling. That's basically a question of trust, and that's a fundamental concept on which our highly complex and interconnected world relies. Bringing it back to the domain of the web, Web development is becoming more and more powerful, and often there are many ways to reach a goal. Typically, I want to present you today two ways in which you can define a link, and I would like you to reflect what do you trust more between a link implemented using an anchor tag with its href attribute, or a link implemented using a spam tag with its onclick attribute. So I guess most of you have the gut feeling that the anchor tag should be preferred, but you might not be sure, certainly sure why. So let me explain you a bit more what are the few benefits of the traditional anchor tag over the span one. Just to be clear here, what I mean behind the word traditional, both the anchor tag and the span tag are valid HTML elements. But if you go check their definition, for example, on the MDN, Mozilla Developer Network WebDoc, which is a very respected and used documentation among web developers, you will see the following two definitions. The anchor HTML element creates a hyperlink to web pages or anything else a URL can address. Whereas the span, the generic inline container HTML element, uh, is used for phrasing content, which does not inherently represent anything. The key point to notice further down in the MDN doc about the span tag is that it's written, it should be used only when no other semantic element is appropriate. So in this case, anchor tag definition matches best our use case of implementing a link. Thus, it's more traditional to use. So now, what are the benefits of using a traditional HTML element? The most impactful one is that you get behavior for free. For example, you probably already noticed that you can right-click on a link to have some actions, like opening in a new type. Some users might also prefer keyboard navigation over mouse navigation, and in this case, they can focus the link with tab and press enter to follow it. Another one, which is more for the aesthetic and related to conveying information visually, is that you get styles for free. By default, browsers natively display links underlined. You also see their state changing when you focus or hover on them, for example. Now, in terms of compatibility, we can say that with traditional HTML elements, they work this way in the past and will most probably continue to work in the same way in the future. So we, there is this kind of backward and forward compatibility. Another one is that, by essence, traditional HTML elements have a better performance since they don't rely on JavaScript at all, which makes them more suitable for cases when there is a bad connection or for very old browsers that do not support JavaScript. Now, coming back to the span case, sure, we can try to enhance this valid span tag to be close to the traditional anchor tag. 
For example, we can apply custom aesthetics with CSS, behavior with Tabinex to add back a focus capability. And maybe this is a bit less known, but you can also add back some semantics with the role attribute that's coming from the ARIA specification that I will define better a bit later. But the question is, how will this enhanced span version perform? So let's check this right away by heading over to some code example. So here, as you can see, I'm in a, in a code pen uh, that contains three links. So the first one is made via HTML anchor tag. The second one is made via the span tag. And the third one too, but it's a bit more enhanced. It looks a bit more like a link. So let's try together to see how, how each one of them behave. So the first check that we can do is simply use them as links. So here, I'm just clicking on the first link, and it's directing me somewhere. The second one, it seems I cannot click, but actually, I do. And if I click it, it's also bringing me to another place, and the third one also. Now, another test. I'm going to press on my Tab key, and you will see that here, for the first one, I can focus it. You see the blue outline here. And when I press on the Enter key, then it's also following the link. In contrary, the second one, you will see I'm pressing tab, but it's skipping it. It's directly going to the third one. And here, for the third case, if I press tab, nothing is happening. If I press enter, sorry, nothing is happening. So it's working halfway. And finally, the last check that, unfortunately, you won't be able to see because the context menu are not shared via this uh, tab sharing feature. But here, if I'm pressing right click on my mouse, I can see that I have the context menu where I can, for example, open this link in a new tab, which I don't have if I try to right click on the two other examples. So as we just saw, even if we enhanced it, the span tag doesn't beat the anchor one as we lose a lot, such as we miss the keyboard handling. There is no context menu to open the link in the new tab. There is no bookmarking capability and possibly many other things we don't know that browsers support regarding links usage nowadays and even more in the future. So the plain traditional HTML anchor solution beats the QWERTY custom span one. Indeed, we have much functionality for free it's more robust, and it has a better performance overall. So you might now ask yourself, why would anyone go the QWERTY custom one path then? So the first one could be ignorance. Not in a bad sense, but it's simply one wouldn't know it better. Typically, there is an infamous ignorance case that people often misunderstand what's the core difference, semantically speaking, between buttons and links. So, if we check the definition of both tags on MDN, here is what we find. The button, HTML element, represents a clickable button used to submit forms or for standard button functionality. Whereas, as we saw previously, the anchor HTML element creates a hyperlink to web pages or anything else a URL can address. The confusing thing that often happens is that it's a usual practice to style links as buttons or vice versa. The MDN documentation refer to this common pattern of styling links as button by stating in their documentation that's often used in the case of website navigation menu. And actually, this couldn't be more true as even their own menu uses this pattern. But as you might expect, they fortunately use it correctly. Indeed, if we go inspect the code, you will see that behind the visually styled button, there is actually a semantically correct anchor tag. For the other way around, another example coming from a very interesting article called, but sometimes links look like buttons and buttons look like links. There is a case of a custom calendar widget where there are three interactive elements that look like links. But if you use them, you will notice that the last one is not bringing you to another place as you would expect it with a link, but it's doing an action as you would expect it with a button, which is to open an overlay calendar. So the takeaway message here is, even if visually sometimes buttons and link stylings are exchanged, and actually visual users are used to it, you should always remain semantically correct in HTML. 
So typically, don't do this. Even if you have a navigation menu item that looks like a button visually, you should not use a button tag in a navigation case, but instead an anchor tag. As a rule of thumb, we can say that anchor tag or form submits should trigger a navigation change, whereas button tag or form elements should trigger a UI state change. Now, coming back to the reasons why someone would not use traditional HTML elements, a second reason can be that sometimes you run into cases where your traditional HTML element cannot be styled. Indeed, in earlier days, many HTML elements couldn't be styled easily, and today some still have this drawback. For example, the select tag cannot be styled as wish. In this case, even if you try to add some CSS styling, most browsers would simply ignore it. That's why you would then maybe look up for role attributes from the ARIA specification that semantically refer to those traditional HTML tags and add them on a more general containers that can easily be styled, like the div containers, for example. As you can see on this cut snippet, one can use the role list box to represent the traditional select tag and the role option to represent the traditional option tag. Now your custom CSS styling will then be better handled by browsers. Finally, a third reason could be that you cannot find a traditional HTML element for your use case. Indeed, quite a few things which, in, which seem common and well-known to you might not have an HTML tag counterpart yet. For example, one might expect to find something to represent the tabs list, but that doesn't exist yet in the HTML specification. So this cut snippet wouldn't be a valid one. In this case, you would construct your own reusable web component by mixing existing HTML tags, such as an unordered list of links that you would hide and show with some JavaScript. In this snippet, you can spot some more ARIA keywords, such as role or other ARIA prefixed attribute. As we will see right now, those ARIA keywords are there to add back semantics. So for the ones that are not yet familiar with the specification, let me introduce it to you. Whenever you see things like the usage of the role or those ARIA prefixed attributes, those are part of the ARIA specification, which stand for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. The standard is currently in version 1.0 and was released in 2014 by the World Wide Web Consortium the main organization that is working for the development of standards for the web. The purpose of this specification is to enrich valid HTML with semantics. But the important thing to understand is that they don't add the functionality itself. If we take back the previous examples of styling a custom select dropdown by using div corners as bases, we can see that even if semantically we represented back the select and options HTML elements via the role attributes, we still need to add the actual functionalities to it via JavaScript, such as dynamically hiding, showing the dropdown, or styling the selected item on hover, providing back the keyboard functionality, updating its semantic state when needed, for example, which item is currently selected with the help of the aria selected attributes to true, and so on. So as you can imagine, this can become quickly complex, as we will see in the following example. So the W3 consortium tries to reach the state of a functional styled custom select that they call collapsible dropdown list box, which we are going to inspect right now. So here, what we are interested in too is first to see that even if it looks like a select uh, element, there is no select tag that's in use. It's really only div, span, uh, unordered list, and list item. But what's interesting to check now is the amount of CSS and JavaScript code. So for the CSS, as you can see, it has approximately 115 lines of code, and that's not really surprising because often the CSS is quite verbose. But what's more impressive is the amount of JavaScript code. So here, as you can see, I'm scrolling, but actually, if I want to go a bit faster, we can see that it's approximately more than 900 lines of code. 
So that's quite a lot to add back to have the functionality that the traditional select tag has from the beginning. So as we just saw, uh, it's a lot of work to start from something non-traditional and try to approach the traditional version as closely as possible, as we had around 150 lines of CSS and around 900 lines of code for JavaScript. And the worst in it is that the support of such custom implementation varies drastically among browsers and among screen readers, which makes a Neville combo. You could spend a lot of your time for nothing, as it could be that the screen readers paired with the browsers of your users don't support your implementation at all. Also, if you dig a bit into the ARIA specification, you will notice that while you find quite a lot, such as list box or tab list, as we saw, you don't find all. For example, date picker is currently missing. So you might be pretty sure that you will reach a point when there is no official recipe available. So what to do then? Let's take a look at the first rule of ARIA that we can find in the specification. I let you quickly read through it. So this can basically be summarized as there nearly always exists a traditional element, even when not abused at first sight. And the nerdy part comes from the fact that sometimes you still need to work on something very complex for your specific use case. For example, a very complex calendar component. Now, before moving on to the final part, Let's take a moment to understand what's a screen reader and how does it work? Because for most visually oriented designers, front-end developers, and so on, a screen reader is this kind of fuzzy, blurry thing that they rather not take their hands on because it's such a different view than they are used to. In short, instead of the visual perspective, it's more the semantic perspective that's emphasized with this tool. That's why, because it's kind of a hard topic to grasp, this part of the presentation will be using comparisons to well-known games to ease your understanding. So to start with, maybe some of you have a gaming past or are still gamers and might recognize this view of the game Age of Empires. On this little video, you see the character walking on the map. The map is initially all black, representing it's unknown to him, and by exploring it, areas are being revealed. Around the character, we can see what represents his immediate view, whereas on the left side, the area becomes darker again, meaning that the character is too far away to see this part now, but he saw it previously. So the character only sees a portion of the map at all time, which is called fog of war in strategical video games. Now let's take a look at another well-known game, Pac-Man. This is another game pattern where Pac-Man is evolving in a maze. And this maze is completely visible to us at all time. In contrary to the fog of war examples before, we don't need to explore the maze to make sense of it. So now let's imagine who it would be to play Pac-Man, but with fog of war. What would this mean to your gaming experience? How would you succeed to get the coins, avoid the ghosts, chase the ghosts when they turn edible, and so on and so on? Basically, it would leave you in a world with a lot of questions mark. Would you find the things that you are looking for or fond of? How would you react when you would find something that doesn't tell you what it is? Or even worse, some elements might be negative to you. So basically, screen readers are like Pac-Man, but with fog of war always on. Some of their char characteristic is that they always start at the top of the page, without having the view of the full page as we do. They navigate this maze by going through the HTML DOM elements. Those elements are sequentially conveyed one after the other to the user. So for example, in this uh, image, Pac-Man would start with the HTML, then go to the head, go to the title, read alchemy for beginners, then go back to the script. But this one is skipped by screen readers. They don't care about script type. So then back to the body element, to the heading one, reading chapter one, equipment, 
then to the paragraph, and so on, and so on. So users using screen readers traverse them, hoping to find what they are looking for and avoiding things that would confuse them or that they couldn't get the info from. One of the biggest difference between screen readers and us seeing a web page is that screen readers are linear, which means one dimensional. Whereas in the case of checking a web page, we can consider vision as two dimensional as it's about the perception of a surface. In this case, as visually oriented users, we can have the overview of a web page within a second. Indeed, we can get a very quick grasp of what a web page is showing us. Maybe we just need to scroll a little bit, but it's very for us to scan the page to get the needed info while ignoring what is not interesting to us. On the other hand, screen readers are by essence one dimensional in the sense that they are using audio, more precisely speech as their output. To better represent yourself what it means, have you ever tried listening to several people talking at the same time? It's very, very complicated. You often start focusing on one source at a time anyway. So what could thus intuitively think that screen readers are slow? But is it really the case? So yes, starting from the very top of the page to the very bottom of the page takes time. But usually, you are not interested in reading the full web page. You are rather looking for something very specific, like an article on a news website or a product on an online shop. Another thing is that speech rate can be increased up to 1 million percent, which is probably never really used as you wouldn't have any chance to understand anything anymore. But still, when you are used to screen readers, you can improve your listening skills greatly. Another important point to understand is that screen readers, users usually don't traverse the full web page. They instead rely on other ways to navigate, such as using the heading outline to jump to specific heading level. This is kind of like reading a book and first checking the table of contents to find the page you are interested about. They can also check for a list of specific things like all the links or all the form controls. But be careful because typically the span that visually looked like a link we saw before would not be recognized by a screen reader and plenty of other possible functionalities. Now let's also understand why screen readers are so important to create accessible websites. One thing that screen readers really put up front is the semantics of the web page. Semantics comes from the philosophy and linguistic, and it's the study of meanings. Applied to UI or web development, it refers to the meaning of the UI elements and the overall meaning of the content structure. As you will see in some minutes during the demo, screen readers will announce things like, this is a heading, or even more precisely, this is a heading of level two, this is a text input, or any other input type like date or so. So screen readers, by evaluating this info and conveying it to the users through audio, enables the user in return to understand and interact with the element the way they intend to. In other words, if semantic is not well defined, we would be in the case of a little Pac-Man running into an unknown box, not knowing what to do with it, or it could lead to negative things. An example could be if someone wants to buy on a shop some fish food, but the label wouldn't be placed correctly and would be associated to cat food instead. Then the users would by accident order cat food thinking it's fish food as the semantic is wrong. That's why it's very important that the HTML is properly built. Let's see an example showcasing this. So here are two simple web pages that visually looks the same, but one has a bad HTML semantic and the other one has a good one. So let's check this together. If here we go inspect the HTML of both example, we can see the following. In the bad example, it's simply like normal div containers with a class h1, a CSS a styling class h1 applied to it. Whereas in the good example, it's actually the correct heading HTML uh, traditional elements that are in usage. So typically, in the back case, screen reader would not announce those visual headings, and the users couldn't use related functionality, like jumping from one heading to the other. Let's verify this assumption by listening to Joshua Muhaim, our accessibility expert, 
who prepared for us a video where he used a screen reader on those two examples. Let's start with the bad version of the document. We can use our screen reader cursor to move through each of the element by just pressing the down or the up arrow keys. Let's just do that. Fruits, apples, Braeburn. The Braeburn is a cultivar of apple that is firm to the touch with the red slash orange vertical streaking. Etc. Etc. So it seems pretty fine, doesn't it? Let's look at the better version of the document, which visually looks identical. Code pet. All right, let's do the same here. Let's use the down arrow key to go through the elements. Heading level one fruits. Mm. Heading level two apples. Heading level three Braeburn. The Braeburn is a cultivar of apple that is firm to the touch with the reds. So as you have noticed, the screen reader does not only tell us the content of the elements, but also that it is a heading and on which level the heading is. This allows us to, for example, press the H character to jump from heading to heading. Granny Smith heading level three. Here's heading level two. Or I can press the key number three to go to the next heading on level three. Conference heading level three. Williams heading level three. This is very useful because Compared to the bad version, let's take another look at it. Here, this is not possible. If I press H, no next heading. It tells me there is no next heading available. So I would like to make a last note on those two examples. In fact, non-coders are also used to this heading hierarchy. For example, when they are using Word, they are able to generate a table of contents automatically if they use the word styles correctly, which wouldn't be possible if they try to apply heading style only visually. As we now understood, screen readers help to discover semantically incorrect web pages that don't look incorrect on the first sight. In a more general sense, they can be considered as litmus tests in the development of accessible interface. The general definition of a litmus test is as follows. If you say that something is a litmus test of something, you mean that it is an effective and definite way of proving it or measuring it. In our web development use case, this would be translated into something like, if a website can be read and operated by a screen reader, it can be considered pretty accessible regarding non-visual aspects. So often, screen readers are used to validate the accessibility of a website. But keep in mind, as we stated previously, that visual impairment is not the only form of disability, and that you should also think of other requirements related to the other forms of disability. For example, having captions for your videos related to hearing impairments. So what can you use for screen readers? On desktop, the recommendation that we will make is NVDA, which you saw previously in Joshua's screen reader demo as it's the most used screen reader, so it has a large community surrounding it. It's a native Windows application. And don't be blocked by this if you are not on Windows, because you can always use virtual machines. It's open source, which means it's free to use compared to other screen readers, which are still very expensive to use, because that's still a legacy from those older days where the accessibility material was very expensive. It has friendly and responsive community, it's especially suited for testing websites as it adheres to standard very closely. And also it's non-intrusive and fast as you can toggle it on and off compared to other screen users which really hack into your system and make it slower. And finally, as you saw, it has a visual cursor and a speech viewer, which is often easier for us visually oriented people to work with than pure audio. For example, it could make your debugging session more efficient. On mobile, as quickly mentioned earlier, the main operating system have their own screen readers built in natively. For example, on iOS, it's called VoiceOver, and on Android, TalkBack. In both cases, they are integrated by default, which make them widely distributed. Overall, they offer good accessibility support. 
And what's interesting is that in contrast to their desktop counterparts, they often are much slimmer to use. Thus, it could be a good choice for a first screener experience if you need it. So now let's do a quick five minute break before wrapping up this presentation with the final part where we will use our screen reader's knowledge to hear how custom auto suggest drop downs sound like in various situations. So I let you go get some water or anything that you would need and let's come all back in approximately five minutes. So welcome back. And now let's take our learnings of how screen readers work to the test by having a closer look at custom drop down examples. One famous example you are all probably familiar with is the autocomplete search field. So let's check how the big companies once perform with a screen reader. For this purpose, Joshua Mohaim, our accessibility expert at Nothing Age, prepared again for us some videos by using the NVDA screen reader on his machine. The first example we will look into is Google Autocomplete that you can find on their homepage. So if you go inspect the code, you will see that the drop-down results are implemented via an unordered list with some area roles to add back some semantics. Let's now hear how it sounds via a screen reader. Welcome to my screen reader demonstration, where I will demonstrate how the Google Autocomplete will behave in NVDA, a Windows screen reader software. I've already started my browser Firefox and NVDA, which you can see here with the display of the speech viewer. My screen reader focus currently is here on the Gmail link and let's move it to the autocomplete element. There are several ways to navigate using a screen reader and one of which is just using the tabulator key, the tab key, which is the same like when we are using a website with keyboard only. So let's press the tab key several times to navigate. Images link. Clickable Google Apps button collapsed. Sign in link. Clickable this is a doodle game that uses ARIA-Live to communicate. Region. Doodle Champion Island Games. Button. Search landmark. Search combo box collapsed has autocomplete editable blank. So this is our auto suggest. And as you have heard already, it is announced as a search combo box. Collapsed has autocomplete, which gives us a pretty good clue already that we can enter some search term. There will be some sort of an autocompletion. And because of the collapsed status, there is something which will be expanded. Let's begin by entering a search term. H. So I pressed the H button. And as you can see, visually, the autocomplete now shows some suggestions. But did you hear anything through your ears? Actually, no. The screen reader did not announce to the user anything about those displayed suggestions. It didn't didn't announce the suggestions themselves and also didn't announce the number of the displayed suggestions. So this is pretty bad. And actually every screen reader user would be very happy probably to hear that there are a certain number of suggestions. So they would know that they could toggle through the suggestions now. Let's do just that by using the up and down arrow keys. Home. HomeGate, Hotmail. And here we see the screen reader announces the currently selected option, which is, which is very good. This is exactly what we would expect an autocomplete to behave like. Let's choose the current option by pressing the enter button. Hotmail-Google search busy. Which reloads the page and tells us that we are now looking at the Hotmail Google search results. Okay. So to summarize what we just saw with Joshua, even if they use some roles attributes, 
the overall result is still quite mediocre in terms of screen reader accessibility, as proved by using a screen reader, as we heard, that even if the autocomplete gets announced as a searchable combo box, it doesn't announce the availability of options, which would be a very useful information for screen readers users. But at least it announces the selected option when using the up and down arrows keys. The second example we will check is Amazon Autocomplete. For this one, we won't even try to use it with a screen reader, as by simply inspecting the code, we quickly see it's only using general valid HTML tags div and span without one single ARIA attribute. So overall, you would have a bad screen reader access experience on it, as typically, this implementation would announce itself as a bare text search, so the user would have no clue that it's a special implementation of a search input, which is about autocompletion. It would also not announce the availability of the options when the options panel gets expanded. And finally, the only possibility for a user to hear the options would be if by accident some up and down arrow, arrows keys would be pressed. But in this case, the selected option would be announced, but that would be more of a coincidence than a real feature. So if we stop for a moment here and reflect what is the context, both Google and Amazon need a dropdown. This dropdown should look fancy, so it needs some styling. As we learned previously, the traditional select tag is not an option for them as they cannot style it to their needs. That's why both went the path to use generic tags. Google put a bit more effort by adding back semantics with some ARIA tags. But in contrary, Amazon didn't make this effort at all and simply used the generic tags as is. In both cases, we can, we can imagine that they had to add tons of JavaScript code behind both solutions to reproduce the select form control behavior as close as possible, which, as we saw, can anyway render bad accessibility-wise with this browser screen readers combo. So couldn't this be done better? Let's remember what the first rule of ARIA said. If you can use traditional HTML elements, use it instead of repurposing a valid element with ARIA role. So the question is, are we sure there isn't a traditional HTML element that we could use for this specific case? If we, if we think back about what is a select tag, it's basically offering a predefined list of options so that the user can select one out of it. Isn't there any other traditional HTML elements that can allow us to select one thing among multiple? I let you reflect about it for a bit. And if anyone has an idea, please write it down in the chat. But if no one has a clue, I, I will move on and give you the answer anyway. Don't worry. So again, what we are looking for is a traditional HTML element that allows us to select one thing out of multiple that we could use for this drop-down list. No one? Just write in the chat if you have any clue. But otherwise, I will simply proceed with the answer, which is actually quite simple <laughs> when you will see it. OK, so I think I will move forward and give you the answer. So the traditional HTML elements that we can use in this case in simply radio button. Joanna, just so you know, um, eh, Mana just uh, actually oh. had the correct answer. <laughs> So, Manar, well. sorry then, it was just by one second I had to switch tab to another one. But so, well done, Manar, it was the correct answer. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Let's proceed. So, yeah, radio button, as we both stated, is the correct answer. And why is that? It's because they are 100% customizable in the sense that you can style their label visually as you would like. You can visually hide the input field by moving it off screen. And so basically, they work out of the box without requiring to use custom JavaScript code to make them behave correctly. All in all, you know that browsers and screen readers know very well how to support them natively. 
and thus it's accessible out of the box. So now that we got the idea to use radio buttons for our use case, let's look at an example of a list box of radio buttons, which is proposed on the accessibility developer guide. So small stop here to tell you a bit more about ADG before checking their example. The accessibility developer guide is a comprehensive resource about all topics that touch upon accessibility. It's tangible and technical, but it's still written in a way that's easy to understand. One of its very useful strengths is that it offers a lot of code examples for you to take inspiration from. It is written by developers for developers, but not only. It can also help designers, content creators, or other stakeholders, but its main targeted audience is developer. Finally, it's open source and maintained by a little group of enthusiastic Swiss and international web agencies, so you are very welcome to contribute too, if you wish so. Now that you know who they are, let's take a look at their implementation example of an autocomplete search that they call autosuggest. If you go inspect the code, you will see that the drop-down results are implemented via traditional radio buttons, as expected. And if you check the amount of JavaScript code, you might be a bit surprised by its length, but it's mainly due to an extra functionality they added, which allows to filter the options up front. Let's now hear how it sounds via a screen reader. So, well, let's have a close look at our mighty magic autocomplete from our accessibility developer guide. You will find it obviously under examples, widgets, and then under auto suggest. We're looking for our proof of concept implementation. Just scroll down a little bit and click on the specific element. I have muted my screen reader, so it will not disturb us, but now let's unmute it again. Speech mode beeps, speech mode talk. All right, let's just see what happens when I enter the element using the tab key. Favorite hobby edit collapse provides auto dash suggestions when entering text five options in total blank. So it tells us that it's collapsed. There seems to be something to be expanded. Um, it provides auto suggestions when entering text. So it gives quite concise instructions on how to use the element. And it tells us that there are five options in total. Let's open those options by using the down key. Blank, expanded. So it tells us it's expanded now. There's something to find now. Let's browse those options using the down key. Hiking, hiking selected. Dancing, dancing selected. Gardening, gardening selected. So this seems to work pretty well. Let's use the filter. A, alert for of five options for double left pointing angle bracket, a double right pointing angle bracket. So it tells us that there are only four or five options displayed now for A. By the way, just ignore those wordy double left bracket angle and double right bracket angle. It's just a way of screen readers how to announce special characters. So now we can browse again using up or down. Dancing, de gardening, gardening, meditation, meditation selected. Nice. And by pressing enter. Collapsed. Provide. It tells us it's collapsed now. And yeah, it would give us again some more <laughs> um, instructions on how to use the element. It's the same that we heard when we entered the element. So this seems to work very well. And now the really uh, interesting thing is how is it implemented in the background? I'm gonna stop NVDA for that by pressing NVDA menu. Exit NVDA dialog. What would you like to do? Combo box exit collapsed alt plus D. All right. So now we are back to our normal browsing experience using Firefox without being kind of enhanced or interrupted by our nice screen reader NVDA. So again, let's let's play a little bit with, with, with this thing. 
It seems to behave very well. It looks like um, the default autocomplete, or at least what we think such an autocomplete should look like. But now, how does it look behind the scenes? Let's disable all visual styles, which is disabling the CSS, the cascading style sheets. Now, when we open the element, wow, we see there are radio buttons actually in the background. Okay, so let's finish this presentation. So to summarize what we just saw with Joshua, as traditional radio buttons are in use, it has overall a very good accessibility level as showcased when using a screen reader on it. More specifically, we heard that it announces itself as what it is, it announces what options are available, it announces which option is selected on top of the total amount of options. And the bright side for the developers is that it needs only a tiny bit of JavaScript. All in all, we reached a solution that is very accessible with few lines of code of styling, few JavaScript, and actually it even comprises an additional filter functionality. Now that you are aware of this guide, if you go browse in it a bit, you will find more examples of using traditional HTML form controls to make complex things like a date picker, a tab list, a carousel, or an accordion. So now that we reach the end of this presentation, let's do a recap. Form controls are very powerful. I guess you knew already that traditionally they are used alone for simple usage patterns, but today you saw that they can handle much more than basic user input. For example, you can combine them together to reach a complex use case. What makes them so powerful from an accessibility perspective is that they are simple and compatible, robust and performant, which means that, all in all, they are accessible out of the box. Finally, apart from few exceptions like the select tag, they can be styled as wish, so you can implement fancy design by still remaining accessible. So to come back to the introductory question I asked you earlier, what do you trust more between using traditional HTML tags that are accessible and full of functionality out of the box, or Repurposing non-traditional HTML tags, which requires a lot of manual work. And at the end, you are not even sure that they will be compatible with your users, browsers, and screen readers combo. I guess now the answer is clear. So please remember what you've heard today. Next time you would be tempted to glue together some random div and span elements with JavaScript handlers. That's about it. So as a reminder, we are here to help you on your accessibility journey with our accessibility expertise, as stated at the beginning of this presentation. Something that might be interesting to you directly is to book a slot in Joshua's, our accessibility expert, calendar to talk anything accessibility related, or alternatively, you can reach out to him via more conventional channels. Secondly, we prepared for you today, and more specifically for the participants of the Deploy Impact Workshop, a quick guide providing you with a condensed checklist of what to check on your code before trying to use a screen reader on it. This checklist is a set of elementary guidelines based on our blog article, five code improvements you can apply today to make your website more accessible. It includes items such as there are no elements other than anchor tag or form submits that trigger a navigation change. And thanks to today's presentation, you now know why. You can download this PDF by going back to the Eventbrite description or by checking your email. To conclude, we hope that with those various resources, we might contribute to your success on making the web more accessible for everyone. With this note, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.